I'd like to welcome everyone to our talks on machine translation or MT. My name is Andrzej Boyar and I do teach and research here at Charles University in Prague. In our talks, we'll be covering machine translation deep and wide, although not as deep as a university class would go and not as wide as the field would deserve. The talks are aimed primarily at MT practitioners and prospective students and they will thus include technical details here and there. Perhaps the most important part for success in MT deployment are well-managed expectations. In many areas, machine translation works tremendously well and brings huge savings, while other tasks are and will remain out of reach. The differences lie in many practical limitations such as available data or language-specific tools. Our goal today is to tease you into the field by showing some of the more difficult examples and also giving you a broad overview of all the aspects of machine translation. People are not usually fooled by natural languages, unless the sentences are constructed to be difficult on purpose. These are called garden path sentences. Take this one, one of the most famous garden path sentences. Fat people eat accumulates. Don't worry if you're puzzled. If we add the skipped words, you'll understand right away. It's the fat that people eat that accumulates in their bodies. You don't need to go that far down the garden path to confuse a computer program. Take the sentence, the plant is next to the bank. Now, is this a flower or a factory? And is this a financial institution or a side of a stream? It's the context that disambiguates. If the surrounding sentences talk about nature, then it's probably a flower. If they talk about production, then the plant probably means a factory. And similarly with the bank, if, they, if the sentences talk about money, it's financial institution. If they talk about amphibians, it would be a river. Some of the observed ambiguity feels systematic. So if we consider the word tank, it can be either the, mi the military vehicle or it can be a reservoir for water or beer. And Arguably, they have something in common. A similar word form in Czech, tancích, such as in the phrase o tancích, which means about tanks, can actually mean either the tanks, talking about tanks, or dances, which is certainly a very surprising co-occurrence. And it doesn't hold for any of other forms of the same word. I've told you is the context that disambiguates. So if we add one of the surrounding words, such as spolechenských, then the phrase can be translated either as ballroom dances, about ballroom dances, or, well, sociable tanks. Let's now have a look on a couple of various approaches how people have tried to tackle the difficult problem of machine translation. This is the famous Vokwa triangle or the empty pyramid and it depicts how the input sentence can be either translated directly to the target sentence or uh, that it can be first analyzed to some formal representations uh, of the meaning. Uh, the upper one would be an interlingua form a representation of the whole sentence regardless of any natural languages. Today we think that the interlingua is not quite reachable, uh, so we do some transfer at one of the lower levels of analysis. So at the beginning, if we start with a source sentence, such as, however, he tried to find refugee in Brazil, we analyze it first word by word to get some which is called morphologic level of analysis. Each word gets here at least the part of speech label. The next step in the processing is so-called syntactic layer or surface syntax, where we now learn the relationships between the individual words in the sentence. We then move to the deep level of syntax, where it's no longer words, but rather concepts that have their notes in the representation. And also things like pronoun coreference are formally captured, so that we know that the person who was trying was the same one who was trying, trying to find the refugee in Brazil. This deep syntactic structure is already sufficient for transfer to the other language, so we now replace the labels of English 
concepts with the labels of Czech concepts, přesto snažit se najít útočiště. And we then proceed down uh, along the uh, pyramid to get the surface level of syntax. And finally, the forms of Czech words in the Czech sentence. Přesto se snažil najít útočiště v Brazílii. That was the most prototypical approach to transfer-based uh, MT. This input sentence is parsed to some deep representation, transferred, and then the final string is generated along the similar uh, lines. Now a completely different level of classification of MT systems is concerned about the internals, whether the systems are so-called rule-based or statistical. Rule-based systems or rule-based components are based on human observations and rules that experts have written in some formal language that the computer understands. Statistical systems, on the other hand, uh, look at vast amounts of data and the computer process them to extract various statistics, word co-occurrence counts, and so on. So here, for example, the word refugee can have dictionary entries for Czech, or we can observe particular translations of this word in some large parallel corpus, in some large collection of sentences that were previously translated by humans. Statistical approaches have the benefit of an easier adaptation to some new data. You just feed in new training documents, but they suffer from random errors in analysis, uh, so the refugee can be seemingly translated as vessels into Czech, which is obviously wrong. Coming back to the Vokoa triangle, we can now argue whether it is better to do the transfer at the deep level of representation or whether we want to translate directly from source to target or whether we want to cross the levels somehow surprisingly. People have tried many of these approaches and they've also found out that it's actually best to run all such systems in parallel because each of them makes typical errors different from the other systems. And if we run all of them at the same time, we can then combine their outputs to produce the best possible translation. Aside from system combination, there is also some work done on automatic post-editing where another empty system tries to fix errors made by the previous systems. So now we have the corrected output. A big field in machine translation is empty evaluation. The output of whatever complex empty system is evaluated either by humans, and people may agree or may disagree about the quality of the sentences. What we often use is some automatic evaluation that usually requires some human reference, some expected translation, expected output of the empty system, and we can then automatically match the output with the expected output. Or we can also work on quality estimation or confidence estimation, where we assess the output quality without access to any reference translation. Another seemingly boring but very important area in machine translation concerns input preprocessing. Here, we have to match what's out there in the wild in our input documents to what the system expects. So that's it for today. Hopefully you now know more about all the various approaches to machine translation and you understand why MT is difficult. We'll do our best to make your journey through this challenging area fun. Next time, we will talk about errors that are most serious from the user's point of perspective. MT that deceives. <laughs>